Welcome to our lecture on the clinical examination and making a diagnosis. The first part of the chapter on clinical examination and making a diagnosis will talk about the clinical examination of the individual animal. Topics under this include history taking, examination of the environment, and examination of the patient. The second part of the chapter will talk about the topic on making a diagnosis. So the topics under this include the steps on making a diagnosis on an individual animal and the steps in making a diagnosis on a herd of animals. For this presentation, we are only going to discuss the history taking process under the clinical examination of the individual patient. The introductory part of this chapter will talk about the introduction to some important uh, terminologies such as the diagnosis and clinical examination. Diagnosis is considered to be the focal point of any investigation of animal disease. Radustich et al. 2006 defined diagnosis as the identification of the disease affecting the patient. The vet practice defined diagnosis as the process of determining which disease or condition explains an animal's symptoms and signs. Clinical examination, on the other hand, is considered to be a critical part in making a diagnosis. It is defined by divers and peak as a search for clues in an attempt to solve the mystery of a patient's illness. It is important because it provides the veterinarian with the information required to determine the disease or diseases producing the clinical abnormalities. The slides to follow will show some important points in the clinical examination of the individual animal. According to Radu Stitch et al. in 2006, the clinical examination of the individual animal has three aspects. These include the animal, the history, and the environment. Additionally, Divers and Peak stated that the clinical examination has three parts. The first part is obtaining a meaningful history, performing a thorough physical examination, including observations of the environment, and selecting appropriate ancillary tests when necessary. Why do we do clinical examination? So we have goals in doing clinical examination. The first goal is to determine the organ systems involved, obtain a differential diagnosis, and of course, ideally, a diagnosis. In most cases, an accurate diagnosis will be reached by an experienced clinician. It is important to note that the clinical examination is an art, not a science. The basic structure of the clinical examination can be taught, but the actual performance and interpretation involved require practice and experience. Clinical examination is a search for clues in an attempt to solve the mystery of the patient's illness. These clues are found usually in the form of signs that are demonstrated to the examiner through inspection, palpation, percussion, and auscultation. The signs are the veterinary counterpart to the symptoms possessed by human patients. Stedman's Medical Dictionary defines symptom as any morbid phenomenon or departure from the normal in function appearance or sensation experienced by the patient and indicative of a disease. On the other hand, a sign is defined now by the same source as any abnormality indicative of a disease discoverable by the physician during the examination of the patient. History taking is considered to be the most important of the three aspects of clinical examination. It is a key to accurate diagnosis. It is also important to note that in history taking, animals are unable to describe their clinical symptoms. They vary widely in their reaction to handling and examination. Hence, a wide range of normality must be permitted in the criteria used in a physical examination of animals. 
So one of the important points in history taking is the cardinal sign of a mission. So this happens, you know, for example, when the veterinarian rejects, uh, for example, the possibility of erysipelatus endocarditis in a sow form because there have never been cases of erysipelas on that particular form. So, uh, because the veterinarian have never encountered the cases of erysipelas on his history-taking process, he or she have um, not included no, erysipelatus endocarditis as one of his diagnoses. And that is no, an example of a cardinal sign of omission. Hence, it is important that the history taking be accurate and complete considering human fallibility, human fallibility in time, and human fallibility in terms of misunderstanding between the veterinarian as the interviewer and the caretaker, no, for example, being interviewed. Another important point in history taking is that the history should suggest not only the diagnostic possibilities but also the probabilities. So we have here an example. In cows, we have an adult cow who is more likely to have parturian paresis than a first calf heifer which is more likely to have maternal obstetric paralysis. So in uh, naturally, you know, in the clinical setting, the adult cows are are, they are really you know, susceptible to parturian paresis uh, as compared to that of the first cow fever, which is a more prone to developing a maternal obstetric paralysis. Here are some important points to consider when doing history taking. The first is the honor or the attendant that must be handled with diplomacy intact. So basically when we say diplomacy intact, there is the art of dealing with people in a sensitive and effective way. So in diplomacy intact, you know, there, there must be a sense of sensitivity to the honor or the attendant. The next is, um, it is also important to use non-technical terms. You no, know, First, because uh, these staff honors you know, are likely to be confused by technical expressions. And secondly, they can be reluctant to express themselves when they are confronted with uh, technical terms now that they do not understand. So it is important that the clinician or the veterinarian use non-technical or use questions that are in layman's term or that can be easily understood now by the attendant or the owner. The third is the clinician must separate the owner's observations from his interpretation. So we must first now differentiate what is an observation and an interpretation. So basically, when we do our observation, we just watch and note what we observe. So para siyang, uh, what we see is what we get. We do not, uh, we do not intend not to inject our observations from that particular, or we do not, rather, we do not uh, intend to inject our opinion from that observation. We just uh, record, no? we just record what we see and report it as it is and not adding any opinion or value to what we saw and uh, that is known as observation. Meanwhile, when we do our interpretation, so of course interpretation requires observation, but it also means that we are making sense of what we see in that particular observation. So in when we are doing interpretation, we add our own opinion the other remark or judgment to that particular observation. So, so basically, an no observation is what you see is what you get. We we don't have you no know, our opinion. We don't inject opinion or remarks to that particular observation. We just record what we saw, while uh, interpretation is adding opinion to our observation. So that is the difference no, between observation and interpretation and the veterinarian or the clinician must be able to delineate or separate between the honors, observations, and interpretations. Another important point is that um, layman seldom describes symptoms and signs in their correct time sequence and part of the clinician's job is to establish the chronology of events.
the important components of history taking are first we have the patient data we also have the the history of the disease and the history of the management of that particular form an important um, component now of the history taking is the patient data so under this we have the species of the animal the breed sex age the type of animal name or number the body weight the color markings of the patient so this diagram shows an example of an initial encounter history form for use in ruminants so some of the patient data now under this are the patient uh, number the 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 patient name or the tag number you also have the date of birth species breed sex weight and others for companion animals we also have a computerized system where all the patient data are encoded and stored for easy access and retrieval the second component of history taking is disease history so under this we have to take into consideration the present disease nor the present problem of the form we also need to take note about the records on the mortality and the morbidity, morbidity rates we also have the prior treatment that is given to the animals the prophylactic and the control measures as well as the previous disease that the form have encountered so first we have the present disease so the present disease, why do we need to take you know, the present disease? So this is aimed to elicit the details of clinical examination observed by the owner in the sequence in which they occurred. So under this, we have uh, to take note you know, the, the variation from the normal functions. Uh, this include, for example, you know, the variation from uh, the intake of food or drink of the animal the variation in milk production, whether there is a decrease in the milk production, uh, a variation in growth, where whether there is a stunt, stunting, stunting of growth. There can also be you know, a variation in, for example, in respiration, defecation, urination, or in other normal functions of the animal. So if several animals are affected, the information you know, can be available you know, from clinical pathological examinations on living animals. Or when the, the case is considered to be fatal, of course, uh, the information you know, are, are available through necropsy, necropsy results on dead animals have important data on morbidity and mortality rates so we have to differentiate you now between morbidity and mortality rates so when we say uh, morbidity rates uh, this is the percentage of animals which are clinically affected compared with the total number of animals exposed to the same risks when we say mortality rates this is the percentage of all exposed animals which Die. We also have another important terminology you know, that is related to mortality rates and that is the case fatality rate and that is the percentage of affected animals which die. So basically the difference you know, between the two mortality rate and case fatality rate is that for mortality rate we consider the exposed animals, all exposed animals as our denominator and the number of animals which die as our numerator for the case fatality rate we consider the number of animals that are affected by a particular uh, condition or disease and our numerator would be of course uh, the the number of animals which die so another important factor under the disease history is the prior treatment that is given to the animals so under this, we have uh, to, to note you know, the exact details of the preparations used and the doses given because this may be of value in eliminating some diagnostic possibilities. So this is important in assessing the probable efficiency of the treatment, whether the treatment is efficient, effective or not, the significance of pathological tests, and in prescribing additional treatment. 
So the rationale of knowing the prior treatment is that drug withdrawal regulations now require that treated animals, their products, be withheld from slaughter or market for a certain period to allow drug residues to reach tolerable limits. Of course, you have to define what is a withdrawal period. Uh, the other name of withdrawal period is withholding period. In the case of milk or eggs, it is also sometimes called as discard time. So when we say withdrawal period, withholding period or discard time, that is the minimum period between the last administration of a veterinary product to an animal and the production of food subs from that animal, i.e. slaughter, taking milk or eggs or honey from you for human consumption. So the this drug withdrawal period you know, must be religiously followed you know, so that the products, the animal products from food producing animals will be safe and free or if there are drug residues that should be within you know, the tolerable limits for it to be safe for public consumption. So another important uh, parameter you know, under the disease history is the prophylactic and the control measures that are in place in the farm. So under this, you now we have we have the clinical pathological test that might have been done in the farm, introduction of artificial insemination to control venereal diseases. So basically, when we do artificial insemination, what we aim is to control sexually transmitted diseases, and also vaccination. When we do vaccination, we tend to uh, this is a prophylactic measure that tends to prevent the occurrence of infectious disease in a farm. So under this, uh, an example under this is the outbreak of mastitis. So careful questioning should be pursued regarding the method of disinfecting the cows teeth no, after each milking. So the, the manner of disinfecting the cows teeth after each milking is a prophylactic measure in order to prevent the outbreak, outbreak of mastitis. So the history of the group relative to addition is of particular importance. When we say addition, that refers to the adding of a live animal to a herd of animals, to, to a group of animals. For example, when we buy you know, our animals the outside, outside from the farm, so for example, we, we buy our breeders in order to upgrade you know, the the bloodline of our animals we live uh, we we buy we purchase uh, live breeders from other farms and we introduce it to our farm so um, this is what we refer to by the word addition and um, it is also important to ask whether the herd is a close herd or our animals introduce at frequent intervals um, the introduction of live animals to the farm is very important, important risk to the farm because, again, live animals are considered to be a potential carrier of disease. And, of course, when we do it at frequent intervals, there is also a high risk that our animals will be infected from the diseases that that particular animal potentially carries. What is a closed herd? So, basically, in a closed herd, um, non-home raised animals such as horses or dogs never set foot on the ranch and any animal that leaves home never comes back. Also in a closed herd, all personnel, visitors and service providers are following extraordinarily strict biosecurity measures, almost exactly like those implemented in the swine and the poultry industries. So for the swine uh, commercial farms, especially the breeder farms, and also true for the poultry industry, you know, the commercial poultry industry, the practice of a closed herd is uh, very, is, um, the closed herd is really practiced in order to prevent you know, the introduction of the disease you now coming from the outside. This is to preserve you know, the integrity of the biosecurity that is already present in the farm in order for the animals under the farm to be protected from the disease that is considered to be a threat to the general health status of the animals under that particular farm. So 
An important consideration under this is, of course, not all additions are potential carriers of the, of the disease. Sometimes uh, the animals that we brought in to our herd are more uh, clean, cleaner, as compared no, to our own herd. So, for example, when that particular farm where we bought our animals, no, where we bought the animals have uh, higher biosecurity measures and they practice no, all the necessary vaccinations, of course, um, uh, that is not no, a, potentially, a potentially carrier of a disease to our farm. Important parameter under the disease history is the previous disease. So, if there is a history of previous illness, inquiry should be made on the clinical observations, necropsy findings, morbidity, case fatality rates, treatments, and others. Of course, we can do this by examining the records of the farm. The third component of the history taking method is the management history. Under this, we have the nutrition, breeding policy and practice, housing, transport, and the general handling of the animals. The objective of taking nutrition as part of the management history is to determine how the quantity and quality of the diet compares with the nutrient requirements which have been recommended for a particular class of animals. For this reason, it may be necessary to submit feed and water samples for analysis to assess the quality of the feed as well as the nutrition of the animals for both confined and hand-fed animals. An important consideration under the nutrition aspect is for those animals for livestock that are on pasture. So for these animals, they receive a diet which is less controlled and thus more difficult to assess. Hence, inquiries about the composition of the pasture, its probable nutritive value, whether rotational grazing is practiced, and whether there is a fertilizer program that should be noted. We also have the nutrition under the hand-fed animals. So, hand-fed animals have a controlled food supply, but due to human error, they are frequently exposed to dietary mistakes. So, this is exemplified by uh, confined no, pigs or commercial pigs no, because they, are, they have no, a controlled fat food supply. As an example, no, we have here the stunted pigs in commercial farms. So for stunted pigs, no, one of the factors for the stunting of growth may be due to, uh, for example, they may not have been kept on a start duration for a sufficient period of time. So for example, when the, the, the period wherein the pigs should have received a start duration have been reduced and they have been fed automatically you know, with the grower grower feed so that may affect um, largely their growth you know, because the of the some issues you know, with the nutrition so the grower feeds may be deficient in this particular nutrient thereby you no know, thereby um, resulting to the stunting of growth of the pigs Still under nutrition, we have the osteodystrophia fibrosa in horses. This occurs when horses are fed you know, containing rations high in cereal phosphorus and limited in calcium. This can also be due to inadequate hand-fed diets containing excess grain. Um, this condition is also known as big head in horses now as shown in the figure as well as brand disease. So this, there is basically you know, a proliferation of the fibrous connective tissue. So an example of the disease you now that is also related to nutrition is lactic acidosis. So this uh, disease you now occurs when cattle are introduced to heavy grain diets too rapidly. We also have the diseases that, are, that can be transmitted by the feeds. So examples of this are the exotic diseases 
may be imported no, in the feed materials, example, or anthrax, put in moccasins, and have cholera. We also have the preparation of the ration. So overheating in pelleting or cooking can reduce the vitamin content of the feeds. We also have the contamination with lubricate, lubricating oil. This can result in poisoning by chlorinated naphthalene compounds. So under nutrition, we also have the feeding practices. So there are certain feeding practices that are being practiced in the farm that can result to the development of the disease. So for example, the when pigs are fed in large numbers with inadequate trough spaces. So this can also result you know, to the development of mal malnutrition in some cases. Now because uh, of course, when pigs will be competing with each other for feed, of course, their feed requirement will be affected and their growth can be stunted. So in this case, we have here a group of starter pigs that are that are feeding. You no, know, some are feeding, and we have here the feeding through feeding troughs of the uh, of the farm. So we can say here that the feeding through feeding troughs rather in this uh, particular case is just enough for this group of pigs. And another we have the calves fed in communal or shared uh, troughs. They are likely to be affected by overeating or inanition. So inanition is malnutrition. So of course this can be a condition when the communal troughs that are being available in that particular form you know, is not adequate for it to serve you know, the feeding that the number of calves that are present in that particular farm. Another condition in swine is the salt poisoning. Salt poisoning can develop when the supply of drinking water is not adequate. So that is why salt poisoning in swine it is also known as water deprivation. Another parameter under the management history is the reproductive management and the performance. So under this, we have the parturition history of the animals. And uh, example you know, under this is the pregnancy toxemia in sheep. This condition occurs late in pregnancy in this animal. We also have the acute metritis. So the acute metritis is possible within a few days you know, after parturition in any species, but unlikely several weeks after. So this diagram shows the vaginal, vaginal discharge scoring system in uh, postpartum cows. So this is a clinical sign of metritis you know, in cows, postpartum cows. Parameter, we also have the breeding history. So under this, uh, this may be of importance with inherited diseases. And the existence of the relationship you know, between sires and the dams should always be noted. So, of course, now under this, we have the term hybrid vigor or heterosis. This is greatest now in crossing two parent animals of completely different breed backgrounds. So, this can be exhibited through a variety of traits now, such as increased survi survivability and growth of the crossbred calves or higher reproduction rates of crossbred cows. So, this is an example of a, a crossbred animal now that can uh achieved no, the hybrid vigor or the heterosis. For that parameter no, under reproductive management and performance is of course the herd reproductive history. So it involves the comparing past and present reproductive performance with certain optimum objectives. So the parameters under this, so we, we only included uh, two parameters to be indicated no, in this, but uh, we have a number of parameters no, under this uh, early reproductive history. So we have here the calf crop or the lamb crop and the pigs with per sow per year. So when we say calf crop, that means the number of calves that are born annually to a particular cow group. You know, this is usually expressed as a percentage of calves weaned from a particular uh, cow group. So this is an example of a reproductive performance of the animal that, that can be uh, compared with the past as well as the present reproductive performance for us to be able to determine you know, whether our animals are at par or are doing well in terms of their reproductive performance. 
the management history, we also have the climate as another parameter. So conditions in cattle and sheep, potrat, can develop or peak in warm, wet summer. We also have the hypomagnesemia or the grass tetany. It can occur you know, in pastured cattle during cool, wet season. So these are uh, some um, abnormalities or conditions that are associated with the climate. We also have the anhydrosis in horses. So basically when we say anhydrosis, you know, that is an increased ability to sweat in response to increased body temperature. Under the general management, we have the hygiene of the farm. This is important, particularly in milking parlors and in parturition rearing stalls. We also have housing. So important parameters under housing include the adequacy of space, ventilation, drainage, as well as the suitability of the troughs. So the troughs should be suitable in, in terms of the feeding space, depending on the number of the animals present in that particular housing. The class of livestock can also be an important factor in the development of certain diseases. So an example of this is the enterotoxemia or the over overeating disease of sheep and cattle. So this is most common in fattening lambs and pigs. Uh, we also have the parturian paresis. So this is most common in milking cows. So those are you know, some of the management history uh, taking parameters that are that are needed not be considered when uh, when doing clinical examination so those are uh, the nutrition the nutrition management of the farm the breeding policy in practice the housing management as well as the general hand handling or the general management